Hey guys, all right, so our first book we're reading this week in our theme of books based on movies is E.T., also known as The Extraterrestrial. This book was based on the film written by Melissa Matheson and directed by Steven Spielberg. This pop classics edition of E.T. is illustrated by Kim Smith and can be found on Epic Books, the app on the iTunes store. All right, with all that out of the way, let's get started. It was the week before Halloween. Elliot wanted to play with his brother Michael, but Michael said no. Come on, guys, Elliot pleaded. I can fight goblins too. Just go get the pizza, Michael said. Elliot went outside and paid the delivery man. On the way back inside, he heard a noise coming from the shed. Elliot lived near a forest. Sometimes coyotes wandered into the shed. But these footprints didn't look like coyote tracks. And coyotes don't roll balls to kids. It definitely was not a coyote. Elliot tried to tell his family, There's a goblin in the shed! A real goblin! Where's the pizza? Michael asked. No one believed Elliot's story. The next day, Elliot went beyond the shed and into the woods to look for the goblin. He saw people with strange equipment searching for something. Were they looking for the goblin too? If they found it, what would they do to it? Elliot had to find the goblin first. So that night, after everyone was asleep, Elliot left a trail of candy from the shed into the house, up the stairs, and into his room. It turned out the goblin liked candy. The next day, Elliot introduced the goblin to Michael and to his little sister, Gertie. Michael and Gertie quickly realized what Elliot had learned the night before. The goblin was kind and very smart. The kids were excited and curious about their new friend. He seemed too nice to be a goblin. Maybe he's a monkey, said Michael. I don't like his feet, said Gertie. We are here, home, Elliot said. Where are you from? The goblin pointed up at the sky. Then he used his powers and some fruits and vegetables to create a model of his solar system. Wow. The goblin wasn't a goblin at all. He was an extraterrestrial, an alien from a whole other planet. Elliot called him E.T. for short. Meanwhile, the people looking for E.T. were getting closer. The next morning, the kids went off to school. Their mom was leaving for work, and she heard a noise coming from the closet. But when she opened the door, all she saw were stuffed animals. After she left, E.T. had the house all to himself. He went exploring. First, he made friends with the local wildlife. Then, he got something to eat. He found a toy to play with and something to read. He watched a television and learned about earth forms of communication, all of which gave him an idea. If only he could find everything he needed. When Gertie came home, she taught E.T. the alphabet. B is for balloon, she said. B, E.T. said. Yes, Gertie said, B, good. Elliot got home not much later and found E.T. in his closet. Gertie and E.T. were playing dress up together Elliot, E.T. said. I taught him to talk, Gertie bragged. Elliot found the box of items that E.T. had collected. He cut himself on a saw blade. Youch! Elliot yelped. Ouch, E.T. said. His finger began to glow. E.T. touched his fingertip to Elliot's, and the cut healed. Then E.T. showed Elliot and Gertie a drawing of something he wanted to build. It looked like a radio. Phone home, E.T. said. E.T. worked on his radio all night. Meanwhile, the people who were looking for E.T. were getting even closer. E.T. wanted his family to find him and take him home. But he had to hurry. E.T. wasn't meant to live on Earth. He was starting to feel sick. The next day was Halloween. It was the perfect time to get E.T. into the woods where he could use the radio to send a clear signal home. Michael and Elliot pretended that E.T. was Gertie. 
Off they went into the streets in broad daylight, and no one suspected a thing. Some of the costumes made E.T. think of home. Away from other trick-or-treaters, Elliot and E.T. got onto Elliot's bike and headed into the woods. When the ride got too bumpy, E.T. took over. Together, they rose off the ground and soared through the sky. They landed in a clearing and assembled the radio. E.T. pointed it towards the sky, and they sat down to wait. Elliot woke up cold the next morning. He and E.T. had been in the woods all night. By the time they got home, the people who were searching for E.T. were at Elliot's house. They were scientists, and they wanted to learn about E.T. They put him in a box to bring him to their lab. As Elliot was saying goodbye, E.T.'s chest started to glow. E.T. phone home, E.T. said. Does this mean they're coming? asked Elliot. Yes, said E.T. Elliot knew this was his last chance to help E.T. While the scientists were busy packing up their equipment, Elliot and Michael snuck E.T. out of the house. Michael's friends brought their bikes and they all raced to the woods. The scientists chased them. To escape, E.T. used his powers again, and all the boys soared up into the sky. When they reached the forest, a giant spaceship was landing. Elliot was sad that his friend had to go. E.T. was sad, too. The tip of E.T.'s finger lit up, and he touched Elliot's forehead. I'll be right here, said E.T. Elliot knew he would always remember their extraordinary friendship. the end. All right, our next book in our series is Back to the Future. This book was based on the movie written by Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale. This pop classics was illustrated by Kim Smith and can be found on the Epic Books app in the App Store. All right, let's begin. This is Marty McFly. It is 1985 and Marty lives in a town called Hill Valley. Hill Valley is a friendly town with a courthouse that's famous because of its broken clock. The clock stopped 30 years ago, after it was struck by lightning. Today, the people of Hill Valley want to make sure the clock is preserved. Marty's best friend is a scientist named Dr. Emmett Brown. Marty calls him Doc. Doc is always making cool inventions, like an automatic dog feeder and a giant guitar amplifier. But Marty's life at home is not so cool. Marty's parents, George and Lorraine, don't seem to love each other. His brother, Dave, and his sister, Lin sister Linda, are always arguing. And George has a mean boss named Biff Tannen. Biff is a bully. He always pushes George around and makes him do extra work. Marty wishes his father would stand up to Biff, but George doesn't have the courage. One night, Doc reveals his newest invention to Marty. He's built a time machine in a car. The way I see it, Doc explains, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? The time machine uses a special fuel called plutonium. When Marty test drove the time machine, he accidentally time traveled to 1955, 30 years earlier. It was long before the mall had been built and before the time machine had been invented. Marty knew he had to get home, so he hid the time machine and went to search for young Doc Brown. Hopefully the time machine's inventor could help him get back to the future. Marty discovered that Hill Valley looked very different in 1955. The cars looked different. The clothes looked different. But the clock was working fine because it was still one week before the lightning bolt would strike it. Before Marty could find young Doc Brown, he found his parents at a soda shop. In 1955, George and Lorraine were teenagers, just like Marty. And that bully, Biff, was still pushing poor George around and making him do his homework. Marty defended George and accidentally interfered with his parents' romance. Now Lorraine liked Marty because he stood up to Biff. It 
oh, this was a problem. If George and Lorraine didn't fall in love and marry, well, how could they have kids? Marty looked at a photo of himself with his brother and sister. Dave and Linda were starting to disappear. It's as if they'd never been born. Marty located the house of young Doc Brown and introduced himself. My name is Marty, and I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that you invented, and now I need 1.21 gigawatts of electricity to get back to the year 1985. Doc didn't believe him. So Marty took Doc to the time machine, but Doc had bad news. There's no plutonium in 1955, and only a bolt of lightning can generate that kind of power. Unfortunately, we never know when or where lightning will strike. Marty told Doc the story of the clock tower. The lightning bolt would strike it in just a few days. Doc quickly put together a plan. If we can harness the energy from the lightning, we can send you back to the future. A wire is stretched from the clock tower down to the street. Lightning strikes the clock tower at exactly 10.04 p.m. 1.21 gigawatts of electricity travel down the wire. A car travels at 88 miles per hour, and the hook touches the wire and sends electricity into the flux capacitor. But Marty, Doc says, before you leave 1955, you have to make sure your parents fall in love. Otherwise, you and your brother and sister will never be born. Marty spent the next few days trying to make his parents fall in love. Marty begged George to invite Lorraine to the school dance. Though George liked Lorraine, he was too shy to ask her. Marty checked the photo again and saw that he was starting to fade away too. He had to do something. Marty remembered that his father liked science fiction. So that night, Marty sneaked into George bed George's bedroom dressed like an alien. I am Darth Vader from planet Vulcan, Marty said. If you don't invite Lorraine to the school dance, I will melt your brain. The trick worked. George found the courage to speak to Lorraine. But Marty knew he'd also have to teach George to find the courage to stand up for himself. Things worked out perfectly. George liked Lorraine so much that he stood up for her to protect her from Biff. And that night, George and Lorraine danced, kissed, and fell in love. Marty's plan worked. And just in time, too, because that very night lightning was going to strike the clock tower. Doc put his plan in motion. He attached a giant wire to the clock while Marty raced down the street, speeding up to 88 miles per hour. But then a tree fell on the wire, snapping it. Great, Scott! Doc raced down to fix the cable before the clock struck 10.04. Doc connected the cables just as Marty drove under them, and lightning struck the clock tower. The electricity powered the flux capacitor, and the time machine returned to 1985, and Marty was safe in his own time. Now because George had learned to stand up for himself, things at home were very different. George and Lorraine loved each other. His brother and sister Dave and Linda didn't argue anymore, and Biff never bullied George again. In fact, now Biff worked for George. I'm almost finished waxing your car, Mr. McFly. George even published a science fiction novel. It was based on a dream he had when he was just a teenager. At least George thought it was a dream. From that day on, Marty and Doc had many more exciting adventures in the past, present, and future. The end. Our final story in our series today is from Home Alone. This is based on the story written by John Hughes and directed by Chris Columbus. This pop classics is illustrated by Kim Smith and can be found on the Epic Books app in the iTunes store. Let's get reading. Twas three nights before Christmas and the McAllister family was getting ready to leave for vacation. Everyone was busy packing. Everyone except Kevin, who was busy getting into trouble. Go straight to bed, his mother demanded. That's enough trouble for one day. Lying in bed, Kevin could hear voices and laughter coming from downstairs. 
Everyone was having fun without him. I hope I never see my family again, Kevin whispered. I wish I was home alone. The next morning, the house was very, very quiet. No one was shouting. No one was running around. No one was telling Kevin to hurry up and eat his breakfast. No one was home. Finally, Kevin realized what had happened. I made my family disappear! For the first time ever, Kevin had the house all to himself. He raced up and down the halls. He jumped on all the beds, and he ate a giant ice cream sundae for breakfast. After watching hours of television, he searched through his pri brother's private stuff and rode a toboggan down a giant mountain. Ah! He even tried his father's aftershave lotion. This was not a good idea. It stings! But sometimes it was scary to be all alone. Kevin was especially afraid of his next door neighbor. Old man Marley was the scariest person who lived on their block. And that night, Kevin heard whispers outside the living room window. Burglars were snooping around his house. You see, Marv said, most of these houses on the street are empty. Everyone is away for the holidays. Perfect, Harry said. We'll come back tomorrow night and steal everything. Kevin was so scared. He dialed 911, but the telephone didn't work. The wires had been damaged in a snowstorm. After hiding under his parents' bed for a long time, Kevin decided that he was just being silly. Only a wimp would be hiding, and I can't be a wimp. I'm the grown-up of this house, and I need to act like one. The next day was Christmas Eve, and Kevin had plenty of grown-up work to do. He walked to the grocery store and bought food. He put his clothes in the washing machine, he decorated a Christmas tree, and he hung Christmas stockings for his parents and brothers and sisters. I miss you guys, he whispered. I wish you would come back. Kevin's family always went to church on Christmas Eve, so that's what Kevin did too. After the service ended, he saw his scary next door neighbor, old man Marley, sitting nearby. You don't have to be afraid, Mr. Marley said. The kids in the neighborhood have lots of spooky stories about me, but they're not true. After they talked for a while, Kevin realized that Mr. Marley was, in fact, a very nice man. Are you visiting anyone for Christmas? Kevin asked. No, Mr. Marley said. I miss my family, and I'd like to see them. But my son and I are fighting. I said some angry words that I didn't mean. Kevin knew exactly how Mr. Marley felt. Kevin remembered wishing his family would disappear, but he hadn't really meant it. You should try talking to your son, Kevin said. Maybe I will, Mr. Marley said. When Kevin left the church, it was already dark. The burglars would be coming soon. He ran all the way home. Kevin made a plan that was full of booby traps. We'll have heavy cans and Christmas ornaments and ice and tar and toy cars and glue and more ice and feathers and a fan. He scattered his toy cars and he smeared sticky tar on the basement steps. He made a big pile of feathers and hid sharp ornaments under the window sills. He sprayed water on the front steps and tied paint cans to ropes. He stretched a trip wire through the hallway and built an escape route to his treehouse. At nine o'clock, Marv and Harry returned to the McAllister's house, ready to steal everything inside. They didn't know that Kevin had sprayed water all over their steps, or that water had frozen into th slick, slippery ice. The burglars stumbled into all of Kevin's traps. Yuck! Yow! Wah! Ew! Marv and Harry slipped on the toy cars and were knocked over by paint cans. Kevin escaped through his bedroom window and ran next door to his neighbor's house. Unfortunately, Marv and Harry were close behind. Now we've got you, kid, Harry said. Mr. Marley arrived just in time. Whack! Whack! He bonked the burglars with his snow shovel and called the police. Then he brought Kevin home. That night, Kevin left a note for Santa Claus, along with some milk and cookies. He couldn't wait for Christmas morning. 
Dear Santa, I don't need any presents. Just bring back my family. Love, Kevin McAllister. When he woke up the next day, Kevin rushed into the living room. Mom? Dad? Is anyone here? But no one answered him. Then he heard a familiar voice. Kevin, is that you? His mother was home. I missed you so much, he said, giving her a giant hug. I missed you too, she said. Where are the others? Kevin asked. The front door flew open and there they were. His father, his brothers and sisters. Everybody was home at last. Are you okay? His father asked. I'm just happy you're all back, Kevin said. Merry Christmas. The end. Well, guys, this finishes up our last book in the series of books based on movies. I will see you next week for another interesting book club. See you later.